Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. All right, I've been repeating myself a lot lately. If you've been listening to this sermon series, you know I've been repeating myself a lot lately, right? In the last several weeks at the start of this sermon series, um, we're talking, I want to always introduce it with some basic stuff. I realize that I'm repeating myself. But for those who are first-time guests here today, the whole goal is so that nobody thinks I'm trying to divide. I'm not trying to be divisive in the church of God. In fact, the overall ultimate goal is to unite, but to unite around God's Word. Does that make sense? So I'm seeking to make distinctions in what we believe, teach, and confess as in contrast or in comparison to other denominations or other theologies. I know that not all churches are part of a denomination. There's some independent churches or non-denominational churches, but they all have their own theology. Usually it's whatever that pastor, wherever he or she went to seminary, that's the theology of that non-denominational church. So they all do have their own theologies. I'm trying to avoid two things in this sermon series. I'm trying to avoid the impression that Christians of another denomination aren't our brothers and sisters in Christ, because they are. Those who trust in the risen Jesus are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we will be in eternity with them. So I want to make sure that I want to avoid that. I want to give that impression that we're not. And the other thing I want to avoid is this. I'm trying to avoid giving the impression that the differences in God's word, ah, that doesn't matter. Because God's word, like Brad was saying, it matters. It really matters. And so differences in God's word matters too. Since the beginning of June, we've reviewed the teachings of Roman Catholicism and also then Eastern Orthodoxy. And then last week, we looked at John Calvin and the teachings of Presbyterianism, right? Today, we're looking at Episcopalians, not the people, but the teachings, the official teachings, and Congregationalism. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Henry VIII, you know who I'm talking about when I say Henry VIII? Some people after our first service, they came up to me singing the song, Henry VIII I am. It has nothing to do, I guess, with King Henry VIII, but that's what they were thought of when they heard me say this. Henry VIII was the king of England about the same time that Martin Luther was a reformer in Germany. In Henry's early days, he was a devout Catholic, but here's what happened. Um, he had this first wife, and he was bound and determined to have a male heir. And when she wouldn't give him a male heir, what a terrible attitude to have, when, he, when she wouldn't give him a male heir, she, he wanted to divorce her, but in the Catholic Church, of course, there's no divorce. You, he didn't want that, so he, he went to the Pope, and he said, I want you to give me an annulment, whatever that really means. I've never understood that. To basically say I was never married to this woman. And so the Pope said, no, you can't do that. And the King Henry VIII, who he was, he said, well, wait a minute. Uh, if the Roman Catholic Church is not going to give me to allow me to do whatever I want, then I'm going to start my own church. It'll be the Church of England, and I will appoint my own archbishop, and I will be the head as the royal. I will be the head over the church, and this archbishop that I appoint will give me my annulment. And that's what happened. And that's how the Church of England came to be. The Church of England, which is also called the Anglican Church, and other parts of the world besides England, they call it the Episcopal Church. That's how the Church of England came to be, all because Henry VIII won an annulment. What a noble start for a church, isn't it? Can you believe that? Well, some years later, he had, I mean, he had had a daughter with his first wife, and her name was Elizabeth, who became Queen Elizabeth I. She was Henry's daughter. And she, under her reign, she worked with the church to cre create the 39 Articles of Faith. But listen to this. It was designed to include a differing viewpoints and oh, avoid extremes, of course. I can't do an a British accent. I'm sorry. I tried to do that. I was practicing that last yesterday. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Can you imagine? So here they had a whole doctrine created to avoid extremes and uh, include differing viewpoints. So I can understand if you're creating some human social club, you might have that. But for the church? God's word? No. Truth is truth. God's truth is God's truth. Some people may think that it's extreme, but that's their problem, right? Their response is their responsibility. But that's how the Church of England was. So read this with me. Paul wrote this to Timothy. 
If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. So was Paul concerned about people thinking things that were extreme? No. God's word is God's word, and people who teach otherwise are just puffed up, and they really understand nothing. They're conceited, Paul would say. Well, as you can imagine, with the Church of England's allowance for toleration with God's word, it's no surprise that the Anglican Church, the Church of England, the Episcopal Church, has pretty much now lost the Bible as God's inspired holy word. One of their bishops of New Jersey actually said this, I am amazed that given the knowledge revolution of the last 600 years, anyone could still regard the Bible as the dictated word of God, inerrant and eternal. And he's a bishop of that church, allowed to be so. This same leader, it goes on, it gets worse. This same leader has rejected the virgin birth of Jesus, and he even rejects the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He rejects that Jesus died and rose from the grave. And he's a bishop in this Christian church. But wait a minute. We know that the Bible verse says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that what? God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if he's, this, this bishop is rejecting that God raised Jesus from the dead, how can he be considered Christian? Whenever a church allows the Bible to be anything other than it is, the inspired, authoritative, holy word of God, sooner or later, that church slides down the slippery slope towards unbelief. Unbelief! Not just, oh, well, they believe a few things different than we do. No. Sooner or later, when you lose the Bible as God's word, that whole church body, the teachings at least, will slide into unbelief. Speaking of the English... This might surprise you about the pilgrims that came to America. We admire them for leaving England for religious reasons, right? For religious freedom. But did you know that they actually helped liberalism to flourish in the church? And liberalism is defined in many different ways. And we're not talking politics here. We're talking you either um, view God's word as the Bible as God's word. That's conservative view. We're conserving the Bible as God's word. Or liberals like, well, some of it might be God's word. Some of it's obviously not because look at those miracles. They can't be described or explained scientifically. So maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. That's the liberal view of God's word, the Bible, right? Well, you see, some within the Church of England thought that the local congregation had the right to direct their affairs, its own affairs. And what, quite frankly, that's a, not a bad thing. We in the LCMS, the Congregations of Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, are fairly congregational. We can a lot, decide a lot of the things on our own. However, we do have our denomination that has general oversight over us, holds us accountable. So if false theology is being preached, they will come in and they will hold us accountable, which is a good thing about being part of a denomination, if the denomination is also biblical. Well, the pilgrims were some of those congregationalists. They brought congregationalism to the New World, and they joined with the Puritans. The problem was they all they had this freedom from creeds, freedom of confessions of faith, statements of faith. That allowed them to stray from God's Word. There was never really a curb of this is accepted Christian doctrine from God's Word, which keeps us in the lines, right? You may not realize how important our recitation and review of the Apostles' Creed is every week. Also, our, the Nicene Creed or the Athanasian Creed, you might think, oh, that's something ancient that we just do as tradition. Actually, they help us keep in the lines and help us to express the biblical truth of our faith. Well, when the doctrinal liberalism reared its ugly head with the pilgrims, or at least their descendants, since they were all about minding their own business, now we don't tell the other congregation down the street or down the way what to think or believe or teach. Well, then when false doctrine creeped in, it started to spread like wildfire because they were congregational. Well, we'll just say what we say, what we believe, but we better not say what they should believe from God's word. There was no accountability, and that's why bad doctrine started to spread. They would not teach the whole counsel of God like Paul said he did in Ephesus. Instead, when the devil tempted them to stray from the Bible, they started to void the word of God and teach men's commandments, commandments of men, as if it were the doctrine of God. 
Through merger after merger, now these groups in 2016 have become part of the United Church of Christ, or the UCC. And on the website of one UCC church in Lincoln, this is what we find on their website. It says, we are Christian. Christian does not mean that we think Jesus is the only path to God. This is the reason, brother and sisters, that why we're doing this sermon series. And I know it's not the most, maybe, I don't know, riveting sermon series. I get that. And I know that um, it may think, well, we're just reviewing other people, and is this divisive? But this is why we're doing it. Because there are people from time to time that will come up to me and say, oh, you know, the different denominations, they all teach the same thing. No, we really don't. There's some huge differences. These churches, the Episcopals and the Congregational, started out to be Orthodox Christians for the most part. But because they lose the Bible as God's holy inspired word, look where we end up. We end up with a whole church body, a whole denomination that says, eh, Jesus is not the only way to the Father. What did Jesus say himself? Read this with me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is what can happen in that slippery slope when we lose the Bible as God's inerrant word. I am so glad that peace is part of a denomination that has confessions of faith that are faithful to the Bible as God's word. Our confessions of faith, they says the only source, rule, and norm for its doctrine and life is Holy Scripture, according to which all teachers and teachings are to be judged. You know, we have so many people that would don't judge me. Well, we don't judge each other's salvation, but we certainly judge each other's behaviors. And if you call yourself a Christian, we actually judge, we discern your behaviors. If it's sinful, we say, brother, sister, I love you, but what you're doing is against God's word. Brother, sister, I love you, but what you're teaching is against God's word. We are supposed to judge each other, not our salvation, and not in matters of adi afra that's neither commanded nor forbidden, but we are supposed to judge each other with God's word as the mirror, as the goal, as the standard. If there were ever a time that the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod got away from the Bible, I'm out. I'll be the first one out of our denomination. If the denomination starts to accept other than God's holy word as the only source, rule, and norm, I'm the first one to leave our denomination. But as long as our, our denomination continues to be faithful to God's word, we are blessed that we believe. We, follow, we are in this denomination. Look, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're a Christian. And so for those Episcopalians and congregations who confessed and trust in the risen Jesus, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we rejoice with them that we have this unity in Jesus Christ, no matter what denomination we're part of. But at the same time, let's pray that they return to the Bible as God's holy word. And let us equip ourselves and our children and grandchildren, especially as they get to courting age and they start to pick who they might evaluate for a spouse someday. Let us do our job to equip ourselves and even them as they start to become adults as well. Because there are distinctions that we have with these church bodies. Let's pray. Lord God, we're trying not to fall off the horse on either side in this sermon series. We don't want to fall off on one side and say that these people are not our brothers and sisters in Christ, because they are. But we don't want to fall off on the horse on the other side and say that your word doesn't matter. It does. So help us to walk that line. Help us to be loving, to speak the truth in love, full of grace, seasoned with salt. But still, Lord, help us to speak and believe the truth. We pray this in your name, Jesus, the Lord of the church. Amen.